Hi, and welcome to a conversation about homework from the heart. We're going to be talking about building and retaining inner resiliency during times of adversity. Advanced care planning from a spiritual perspective. Over the course of four parts, we're going to focus on four key areas, and we will cover resiliency in the role of advanced care planning, mental health and well-being when faced with adversity, compassionate communities, and the vulnerable sector of Canadian society. So my name is Laurel Gillespie. I'm the Director of Advanced Care Planning with the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association. I'd like to thank everyone today for joining us about these discussions about resiliency and how we can remain healthy in our minds and our souls during this time. But before we begin, we'd like to take this opportunity to have a moment of reflection regarding the social unrest our neighbours to the south of our border are experiencing and to just let them know that they're in our hearts and in our thoughts and that we wish for them peace and good health during these difficult times. Our guest today is Reverend David McGinley. He's a spiritual counselor with cancer palliative care and ICU programs at Queen Elizabeth II Health Sciences Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He's also the author of Beyond Surviving, Cancer and Your Spiritual Journey. David has survived cancer not once, not twice, three times, but four times, which resulted in a profound near-death experience and explorations and the nature of consciousness and the connection of the body, mind, and spirit. He is an advisor for provincial and federal cancer initiatives and lectures throughout Canada on integrative spirituality in healthcare. David knows what it's like to have cancer from both sides of the hospital bed and has a sense of this life from both sides of the veil. So David, I'd like to begin our conversation by talking about finding and building resiliency from within during troubling times. And you certainly bring to the table a profound life experience around battling cancer. And during those uncertain times, I think it's important to recognize a couple of different things, mainly that resilience or what I like to call the R2 factor, resiliency reserve. Um, I'd like to speak to you a little bit about that and that not all of us naturally have a reserve of resiliency and within us and that we have to work at it. And, you know, I think the resiliency is based on some of our life experiences and some more traumatic than others. Um, but it's difficult that, you know, sometimes people don't have that the skill set or the mindset to adapt to difficult situations and find things more challenging to, to, I guess, um, sort of break down and, and absorb them and then let them go. And we tend to hang on to things often. So when stress, adversity, or traumatic events strike, you may experience denial or resentment, grief and pain, but you're able to carry on physically and psychologically. But how is it that some people are better able to do that than others? And, and what makes that difference? So when you say, um, and you said this recently, was that resiliency is not found in being strong, but being real and the connection of authenticity and grounding us in vulnerability and strength. And I, I was wondering if maybe you could elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, please. sure. It's such a difficult and complex topic. So thanks for having me on. Thanks for the conversation. And thanks for bringing up this topic, especially at this time. I mean, it feels like the world is crumbling. The chaos, every week there's some new madness that comes upon us and uh, what's happening in the United States and throughout the world. Oh, I, I have no words. How can one be resilient in the face of that? Uh, resiliency is found in community. Uh, we have very limited resources in maintaining resiliency on our own steam. So when we have community and connection, there is an exponential increase in resiliency. Why some people have more of it than others? Oh, so multifaceted. I, I know that through my cancer journey, I was resilient every now and then. Most of the time I felt like a wreck. Uh, you know, you bumble through your days and you do what you can. But it's pretty clear i think i would even say it's visceral your body knows when you've connected to your resiliency because suddenly that fight or flight 
response calms down. Uh, you're breathing deep. Your head is clear. Your heart is engaged. So I think this is a, a skill built over a lifetime. And as you say, crises will accelerate the homework of building that resiliency. When I say it's about being real instead of being strong, uh, I think back on the patients and the many people I've known who have been so authentic in their character while they go through a very difficult time. I had such admiration for them. And I realized their strength came from being real, from being authentic, by knowing who they were, by being grounded in something infinitely more powerful than keeping your cool uh, or, or you know, taking care of others, being strong for them. It was grounded in compassion, compassion for others. It's, it's as if when you are suffering, it can awake a compassion for others, and that helps you return to your best self and even forget your own troubles or, or join them in solidarity with others. So, you know, that's, that's what I try to practice every day with my patients, and that's what I feel we need as a world to practice for uh, all who are marginalized, for all who are wounded by social injustice, and all that's amplified by what's going on these days. Compassion. That's the key. Uh, I love the Buddhist tradition. They talk about being a, a bodhisattva, a warrior of compassion. <laughs> that's pretty cool. It, um, it has its own wisdom. When you're compassionate, you are wise. And uh, you're fully present in this moment. It's, it's great. It's difficult to maintain, but it can be learned and wired into us. That's, that's really quite profound. And, and um, as I think about my own personal journey through cancer, um, it is it's amazing how you may not often think that you're very resilient, but until you're facing an adversary, adver adverse, adversity, yeah. you really recognize them and see just how strong you actually are. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the support and the compassion that you put around yourself. Yeah, Would you I, agree? I totally agree. In fact, I'm grateful that I didn't know. Uh, looking back, I can see how I was stronger than I thought I could be, how I faced things that I couldn't imagine facing. But if I knew how strong I was at the time, it would have just gone to my head and derailed my whole integrity. We cannot see ourselves accurately from inside our own experience. That's why I say we bumble along and do the best we can. But to experiment with compassion as a tool, sincere tool to center yourself, in wisdom, connection to others, solidarity with those who suffer. Uh, it changes your relationship to your own suffering. It empowers you to be fully present in the moment. You know, when, when we're going through cancer, when we're fighting for more moments of life, it's ironic because we're often not present in the moment that we have. Compassion for others awakens our embeds us more fully in this moment. And that's how we can not only go through suffering, we can grow through suffering into the better part of ourselves. Those are great, that, those are great insights into um, resiliency and strength and, um, and, and compassion. Um, are, are there some of your other thoughts around how people can build their resiliency reserve or their personal R2 factor? Especially yes, in troubling times like today, especially there's so many uncertainties, so many unknowns. And when we don't know what's happening or we don't know, you know, what the future may hold for us, that creates fear within. And maybe you have some thoughts on that and how we can build our personal R2 factor. Yeah, it starts with the basics of the body. The body will tell you the truth of how you're doing. Your mind will tend to deceive yourself or overestimate how well you're doing or, 
over uh, exaggerate how poorly you, you you're doing the body will tell you the truth so i always say take a moment of mindfulness to build your resiliency check in and be real right now how am i doing uh, now when i feel stress and you know that fight or flight mechanism it shows up first in my gut my stomach is you know i call it my stomach goes blarg my breath becomes shallow my heart is racing right uh, my muscles become tense so the body will tell you hey pay attention something's going on then uh, th this actually follows a, a simple acronym for the word stop so the s stands for stop the t stands for take a breath a good breath o means observe i'm going to observe my body how am i what is my body telling me so you're trying to fully show up with yourself in that moment okay now that i'm fully here and i'm listening to the body i'm going to breathe into that and observe it i'm going to stay with that don't do it for too long you know 45 seconds 20 seconds breathe into it and then the p for stop means proceed go do what you need to do so that's the first thing stop the second thing to build your resiliency is connect reach out to others connect to those you love because it's not about facing it alone and being the hero it's about coming together and healing the world together this is um this is really hard because we know loneliness is epidemic in our culture so many people don't know how to reach out and they don't want to because they worry that they're grief or their worry is going to be a burden on others especially those they love so they hide their grief we're talking about advanced care planning so at the end of life uh, i find many patients will put a lot of energy into protecting their family from the emotional burden and weight of the experience so they will say i'm fine right fine another acronym it means flustered insecure neurotic and emotional <laughs> well these days we are all fine. <laughs> we don't need to protect each other from, from that sadness or that grief. When we let others in on that, it builds intimacy, it builds emotional vocabulary, it builds connection. And it, it's a beautiful thing, but it requires vulnerability. That's the path that leads you to strength. So stop connect and uh, the third one I, I like i like things in in threes is use gratitude gratitude has a power uh like a compass of refocusing the heart and um that, that gratitude you know combined with compassion well that there's no more noble aspect of our character as human beings that could ever emanate from us than, than those qualities. This is amplified at the end of life. When you're considering leaving this world, uh, to do so with a heart that is grateful and compassionate, fully present and connected, that's a successful life. I, I couldn't agree more with what you just said there. And, and as I reflect on my own experiences around being diagnosed with a terminal illness 13 years ago now, I beat the odds, but um, it, it's really interesting how it changes your perspective on things and how you really rapidly begin to learn what the things are that really truly matter to you. And that you're so very grateful for all everything and the little things that you might not have given a second thought to before um, it really changes your perspective but you have to also allow yourself to become vulnerable um, and then you lead that that leads into the acceptance part and then you move on so from that i my personally i decided is that from now on i will not ever second guess decisions that i've made and not live my life with regret but i will make mistakes along the way and it won't be perfect and yes. uh, I'm just so grateful that I'm able to just be able to still make mistakes, right? <laughs> and it's accepting it, but it's, it's also part of that full gratitude that it's not going to be perfect. 
Um, but just being, being mindful of um, that we're so very fortunate to, to have good health um, and, um, and live in such a peaceful, peaceful country. Yes. Um, so many things to be grateful for right now. And out of that gratitude can come great wisdom as you fill out your advanced care plan, right? Uh, that is an act of such love. It, when we talk about your instinct to protect your loved ones from suffering, advanced care planning is going to really help you do that by making your wishes clear and by stating them clear, you know, simply. And it can orbit around some fundamental questions. When I die, because it's all going to, it's going to happen to all of us. When I die, where do I want to be at home or in hospital? How do I want to be awake or unconscious? you can have some control over that. Mm -hmm. Who do I want to be there, right, at my bedside? And what do I want it to be? Uh, well, I want it to be peaceful. I want it to be marked by as little suffering as possible. Filling out an advanced care plan, getting palliative care on board uh, at, the, at the best moment, all of that can make sure the turbulence is minimal and your takeoff is smooth. Mm -hmm. really important stuff because this is the ultimate trip of your life it's best to plan for it and i love i love the speak up uh, material and the advanced care planning website boy it gives good resources on starting these difficult conversations and making these clear decisions and that was that's kind of where i was going to go with um, my next question for you was about how, would, how can advanced care planning help us maintain or even reserve or restore resiliency during difficult times um, and build our capacity around it? Um, and I think with the Speak Up campaigns, I was, you know, we're always kind of bouncing ideas around and, and how to reach out to people and engage them in these really often difficult but essential conversations around what your wishes and values and beliefs are and normalizing that conversation. And I had sort of a thought one day, is that, to my team, um, which is just an amazing team that we have at Advanced Care Planning um, and the Speak Up campaign, is they said, well, no one said, you know, the next time I die, said no one ever. Like, you, <laughs> it's gonna happen, but you don't get a do-over. It, it's So you might as well make it what you want, and that's something that you do have autonomy and control over, and you can have a voice. Um, and, and the other sort of profound thing that we, we kind of all agreed on is that um, when it comes to advanced care planning, it, it's really something that it's, it's up to you to voice um, who you want to speak for you, what your care would look like. And that, you know, engaging in the, at the point which, in which you engage in advanced care planning, um, it can be too late at some times and in, in some certain, certain, certain circumstances to engage in advanced care planning, but it's never too early to start in that process. Oh, it so doesn't have to be about end of life care. It's sort of milestones, you graduate from university, what might I want if I was not able to speak for myself? Uh, often you'll hear workshops that are being conducted across the country, you know, what if you were hit when you're out on your bicycle, going back and forth to work, or um, you know, these sudden, sudden and tragic events that happen and, and you find yourself not able to speak for yourself, or there's the serious illnesses, and the terminal illnesses, but it can be too, at some times it can be too late to engage in, in, in solid advanced care planning, but it's never too early. Yeah, so the time to do it is now when you're feeling well, when there isn't a crisis, right? And think of it as a, you know, yes, it could be an imagination exercise. You're trying to, you know, run the scenario of, well, what do I want when it happens? Hopefully it's decades from now, but it's good to rehearse. <laughs> It's good to talk about it. You know, in our culture, we don't talk about death and dying, certainly not our own. And when people are asked, they, you know, they usually say, oh, I want to die fast, or I want to die in my sleep. Mm -hmm. You can have more detail than that. I, I want to imagine that you're going on the ultimate trip and you're going into a desert. Now, you're not just going to walk into the desert. You're going to provision. You're going to research what supplies you need, you're going to go get them, you're going to learn how to use them, you're going to have, uh, uh, someone's going to know where you, you are, you're going to let them know 
about all of this. And then you take your trip, you begin walking into the desert. Now, it's a incredibly harsh landscape, but in it is hidden such life. Uh, the desert blooms when a rainfall comes, and uh, the flowers. It's filled with animals beneath the sand and, and sometimes in the air. Uh, getting familiar with that landscape is really important for your survival. But when we're talking about the final crossing of the desert, there comes a point when you will run out of water, when your strength will fail you and you lie down. Advanced care planning prepares all those supplies and all of your team to walk at your side, not taking your steps, but walking at your side until that point when you can walk no longer. And at that point, you must, well, I really encourage you to do it. We all actually have to give yourself to the wilderness, to give yourself to the sand and the wisdom of your body, which is wired with the knowledge to come into this world and to leave it. That's the point that a lot of people dread because then they don't have control. Well, no, you give up the ego's control and you rely on the good planning that you've done so that the process from there on is smooth, is gentle. And in my, of course, as a, as a man of faith, I believe death is a transformation, right? I, I forgot who, who said, life does not end with a period, but a comma. It's, advanced care planning is a really important part. And it's, and it's a new development, right? We're one of the few cultures that, um, that, that have developed this philosophy in the history of humanity. That's, that's, that's a really good point. And, and you know, we're, we have other countries that are looking to Canada to see what we're doing and, and keeping their, their, their finger on the pulse of what's happening in, in our great country. And that's largely due to, you know, some of the dynamics of, of, of Canada, that we have great cultural diversity. We have a very, you know, the second largest land mass. Um, and, and our population is not that dense. So we have great challenges in how we deliver our health care. We're, we're seeing um, many lessons that we're learning in that right now with the COVID pandemic. Um, but with advanced care planning, it really does come into alignment with a life well lived is really a life well planned. You know, we go through painstaking processes of planning, as, as you say, you know, for ultimate trips and, you know, you would plan for your provisions, et cetera. And the same thing's true if you want to get a puppy. You know, you, people will research the breed of dog and decide what size of dog and they go through this process. Um, but we don't give our future health care needs a second yeah. thought. And it's part of this program and, and promoting advanced care planning is that really it should be as normal um, a process as, you know, estate planning or financial planning and looking towards your future and what your needs may be and what you want and what's important to you. And part of that is, is how we do care for each other and creating compassionate communities. And, and as you say, I think we, you mentioned one time in one of our recent conversations that we had offline was um, that really advanced care planning is like the homework of the heart. Yes. And yeah, and I'd love to have you talk a little bit more about that and, and that it's really one of the greatest gifts that you could give to your loved ones and those who are in your, your circle of trust for lack of a better way to describe it. Yeah. Um, if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah. I'd that, yeah, let's go there. The homework of the heart. At the end of life, the only thing that matters is love. We, um, we reflect back on how that went well or did not, right? The love we fail to give in life becomes the pain that we carry through it. And I've sat with countless patients and people who look back on the unfinished love stories and the broken bits and relationships. And they try to be compassionate and forgive all that and let it go. But, you know, we all mess that story up a bit here and there, sometimes repeatedly. An advanced care plan is a beautiful way to love those who care for you, to guide them. You are the teacher, you are the shaman, you are the mentor in this in this enterprise and 
you are teaching them how to live and die well, how to communicate about the deepest things, the most, which are actually very simple things, but they're not easy things. They open up that conversation of, what do you mean to me? And who am I to you? I am, uh, I'm so astonished when conversations around advanced care planning uh, can encapsulate the four most important things you could ever say at the end of your life. Thank you, I love you, I forgive you, and goodbye. When those are said well, one dies heart whole, right? And, um, and not only loving others, but we astonishingly become love itself. And that is the spiritual enterprise. That's the ultimate spiritual victory to become love, because God is love. And this is independent of any specific religious tradition. Any healthy spirituality is going to point in that direction. It's ironic because I can only be love when I am also vulnerable and broken, because then I can know to the bone the brokenness of humanity, right? Which brings us back to the crisis happening in the States and and uh, the racial tensions and uh, the strife throughout the world. Only when I know suffering um, and brokenness can I be truly compassionate to those who suffer. Um, this is all intertwined as the homework of the heart. At the end of life, uh, it's, not, it's not what you take with, well, it is kind of what you take with you, but the only thing that you take with you to heaven, I, I, how do I say, I, I like to say, your relationships are the only clothing you wear to heaven. So advanced care planning is not just about those details logistically about the end of life. It's about the relationships and how to leave this world a little softer and kinder to yourself and uh, to the strange journey that you've traveled. Mm. <laughs> so you bring, um, you something that, that uh, segues into the, the next kind of section that I wanted to talk to you about was um, around mental health. And, and I don't know, there's still, there's something to me that's a little bit strange about the term mental health. Um, and, and that I like to think about it as, as um, having a healthy conscious mind um, as part of mental health, right? So, um, that being conscious is is really about being aware and cognizant um, of recognizing that something within or outside of oneself um, is is realized and and it's about um, an extreme um, sometimes weariness of our own environs um, but being aware of what's happening and, and it can look look much different to different people um, but the mind um, is really about the set of thinking um, including, you know, your cognitive aspects as consciousness, but imagination and perception. It's how we perceive these things and we process them. And that to me is having a good, healthy, conscious mind um, equ is equivalent or equates men good, good, positive mental health hygiene, um, if you will. And, and I think I can't but help feel that many people are struggling with that right now, not only because of the, the, the qualms of a pandemic, but also because of the struggles, the many struggles that people face. And, and I wondered if, if, you, if you think of the conscious mind involving all the things that you're currently aware of and thinking about, um, and how do we try to preserve and protect that somewhat when we're dealing with all these outside influences? And, we may have our own beliefs internally, but it's all these external things that are happening um, and can have a, a bit of a grave impact. And, but, and, you know, and then I kind of tie it back to advanced care planning and that's something that you can control or you can have um, some say in and, and ensuring that, you know, so if something were to happen to you um, and it can reduce some of the anxiety and the fears that might inhibit us from having a healthy conscious mind. Um, and I wondered if you could speak to that maybe yeah, a little Boy, uh, Laurel, as you bring up mental health issues, it, you know, awakens in me the, the, uh, the ignorance, the, the inability I have 
to truly appreciate what so many people go through in our culture and society. I only know my own experience, right, from the inside, but I recognize that mental health issues are epidemic. And we, we talk about the COVID pandemic, um, that is amplifying the, the significant severe mental health disparities, uh, you know, in, in the extreme challenges people face. You cannot know someone else's journey. You can only walk beside them as best you can, right? And like my own cancer journey, I know mine. I, I don't know yours. I can relate a bit, but so when we're talking about mental health issues, loneliness, depression, anxiety, right? These are, um, th these are, tend to be worse in the most developed countries. Um, and um, we have all this technology that we can connect, but, but people are aching for deep, real, authentic connection and community. So mental health is always tied to community. I, nobody can maintain their mental health on their own for, you know, for too long, unless we have other uh, people and personalities and to, to reflect and bounce off and engage with, then we're left with uh, the, the strange community of critical voices in our own mind, in our own head. Planning, let's come back to advanced care planning. Uh, taking the simple steps, to support mental health and, and to plan well. Taking care of the body, listening to what it's telling you, exercise, not extreme, just exercise, S eat well, sleep regularly, limit your intake of toxic media and screen times, but don't shut off the pain that people are going through throughout the world. Right? Uh, it's one thing to watch the evening news and ache for those people gathered struggling for justice. It's another thing to stay up till four in the morning watching it. Um, you've got to maintain your own resources so you can be of help to others, which again is back to the homework of the heart and advanced care planning because that's maintaining your resources well uh, so that you can help others uh, face that ultimate challenge and, and transformation. Everything is interconnected. Nothing is insignificant. We talk about the health of our culture, of our society. Injustice, uh, the, the limited access to palliative care, uh, the poverty of our conversation around death and dying, our insatiable desire for more possessions as an existential comfort against oblivion or transformation our rejection of traditional religious ideas because they have not spoken intelligently and adequately to our sense of place in the universe, let alone our life story. And the injury we absorb from others in authority. It's all connected to the homework of the heart. How do I love? How have I been loved? Is, is there a God of love out there? Is there a God of love in here? Right? How can I be an instrument of such peace and wisdom? We're going to need a lot of podcast conversations to explore all of this. <laughs> yeah, there, there's much work to be done <laughs> around the advanced care planning, and I say that with with um, with a jovial with a jovial heart, um, and that. You know, it's important to me, some people, I, I guess I'm going to turn to the national poll that we did um, in early 2019, the beginning of this initiative, and 80% uh, of Canadians believe that it's really important, but only one in five have actually created a plan. And, um, you know, if there's a silver lining that could come out of the, the unfortunate things that we're experiencing right now would be that people are are more aware, acutely aware of the importance of, of how it can actually help you as a patient one day, and not only yourself, but that those who you're surrounded by. Yeah. And it, to me, it's an unselfish thing to do is, is, you know, being the, I guess I'm coming from a place of my heart as the, as the youngest of eight children and having lost both parents and neither one of them had an advanced care plan. 
know, my mom passed first, my dad passed second. So we had a better idea. My dad would always want to talk about what some of his wishes were. It's, it were the children, us, who didn't want to dare go there because we couldn't bear the thought of what life would be like without him. Um, but it's really, to me, it's, it's an act of unselfishness or unselfish love is to, to be able to provide um, that information. Uh, and it's really not that arduous to just start the conversation, and but it's so very important. Yeah. And for your own mental health, you're going to discover that when you do your advanced care plan, it's empowering. It addresses the anxiety about the ultimate. It puts handles on the chaos. It helps you drive your life your hands on the wheel all the way, right? And uh, others are in the car with you and, uh, you know, you, you want to make that road, that flight, whatever, that, that journey smooth. It's very empowering to close that binder up and know, yeah, I did it. I, uh, I can check, I can put a big check by that box. It provides um, such a sense of relief. Yeah, and right. when we direct, wow. when we address death, when we face death in this way, plain and simple, uh, we are facing the ultimate existential uh, tension and, and fear and dread. And we discover that, okay, I, I'm not that scared of it now. I'm becoming familiar, even um, comfortable talking about death or thinking about my own. Let's remember in Canada, the majority of people, uh, I believe the majority of people die in hospital or a, a great percentage of them. And the majority of people who die, die comfortably. Good palliative care and good pain management, right? And, and don't be shy about the drugs. They're there for, to match your pain and uh, make you comfortable. Um, death, when I speak with the dying, and I've been with hundreds and hundreds of people as they died, so many have been surprised to discover that they can do it. Now, yeah, there are bumps, there are setbacks. It's, it's never totally smooth, but good palliative care and good planning, usually, like massive majority of the time, result in a smooth exit from this world. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to see too, there's, there's, quite, there's been quite a shift in the medical community over the years that palliative care is becoming more accessible and the quality of care that patients are receiving is, is improving. But I think there's a, we could do a much better job at it. And, and I think we're, that's some of that is lights being shed on that, um, particularly with the situations within our long-term care homes, which would be an entirely other, another discussion all on its own. Yeah. Um, but we're doing some incredible work around around that piece um, with some of the resources that we're currently creating. Um, mm -hmm. And we're part of this project that I'm excited about, as well as our home care um, toolkits for the community, the community, for people who want to stay within their homes. So I wanted to kind of um, bring this around a little bit now that we've talked a bit about, um, you know, the mental health piece is, is building compassionate communities. And one of the the things that I, I, I wish that we were seeing more um, awareness of within the media um, and looking at what the potential lessons learned are from this is the vulnerable sectors of society. So when I think of those who are homeless, not by choice, but by whatever circumstance may be um, for their life experiences, that's where they find the position that they find themselves in. So not only do you have people who are coming from, you know, shelters where they share meals, a meal a day with 600 other people. And if they find lodging for the night within a shelter, they're having to share um, space with others. And, you know, they're trying to do this physical distancing, um, but they're not able to because that's not a realm of their world and we're not really talking about it. The other is within the correctional services um, and as well for those um, who are dealing with isolation who have um, disabilities. Um, so they, you know, they're, they maybe don't have access to their personal care workers anymore or the supports that they, the luxuries, if what little bit of luxury, if one could even consider it that, to have access to, to some care or assistance. And I often find myself thinking about how they're managing it. And that kind of brings me to 
what maybe your some of your thoughts are around building capacity around compassionate communities and recognizing the more vulnerable in our society and and uh, and we can touch on the advanced care planning too but um just from that perspective of compassion yes when um, we see such suffering and disparities of wealth and resources right when we see such injustices or such uh uh, epidemic poverty um, and struggle uh, in cities and, and provinces and communities that are actually very wealthy. That is an invitation. That is a, um, a call to compassionate action, right? Uh, that's this opportunity for those who have, you know, and systems that are, are uh, able to step up and put in creative, empowering support systems that primarily and you know first restore and respect the dignity of the people that they are there to serve, right? And empower them for for good choices and uh, to build community and and not to do this for them or to them, but with them, right? Involved in the conversation because otherwise it's not community. Um, any, any suffering uh, is this opportunity for transformation. When we come back to like cancer, getting a, a diagnosis of cancer or a serious disease, I find it so helpful to, um, when, when people move from, why is this happening to me? Move from that to, what am I gonna do with this? How am I gonna use this to the struggle to deepen my humanity open, wake, wake me up to the texture of life and the gift of today and connect me to others to, to build community. How, how, how can I be sure that I'm not going to waste the crisis because I don't know how to navigate it? Uh, well, that's, that's where community and experts and uh, connections, there are people around who know, have great insights and great creativity and, and great compassion and and uh, resources to, to do this. We're talking about an incredibly complex, multi-level um, situation in, in our society. It can be overwhelming. I'm shocked, startled, amazed when I hear social scientists point out that actually we live in the most peaceful period in human history. People are living longer than ever uh the number of the percentage of the the human population that lives in poverty extreme poverty is at, at an all-time low and uh, all of this continues to improve that's great however <laughs> there's so much more we can do we are aware of the waste we uh, the extremes of uh between the ultra rich and the poor they're, they're the disparity is wider than ever so let's not let the good news of how the overall picture is going take the fuel out of our drive or the focus out of our vision to to make this world a better place and you do that with the people in front of you and the person inside who you are well 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 put david um, I, I can see maybe future uh, discussions coming up and we can maybe hone in and focus in a little bit more on some of these things. Um, so much to talk about, but boy, this hour has been pretty thick. Wow. <laughs> well, you know, I, I wanted to touch upon, um, you know, the whole building compassionate communities and um, how the element of advanced care planning. And I think about uh, as you know, on a personal level that advanced care planning is, it's very much about how we care for each other um, within our own little nuclear units, but in the broader broader perspective, um, it, at a community level, um, we, we reduce the anxiety on those, as you would know, working within the healthcare sector and those palliative care units and ICU units that, you know, when advanced care plans are put in place, um, it reduces the stress not only on the patient and the families and their loved ones, not even during those later phases of, of life, 
them and, and even in the bereavement process for the families, but it also reduces the stress and anxiety for the healthcare professionals yeah. because they have provided direction. And so to me, I, I look at it and I just think, how could you not want to do this planning? Because it's a win, win, win. Exactly. Um, well over 60 is well over 60 percent of of uh, resources go into the last six months of life in, in resources in the healthcare system so expenditures in healthcare uh in canada um and in western countries so most of the resources go into the last six months of life why well because we're scared and anxious and cramming for the exam and trying to extend this life in the face of a crisis an advanced care plan can lower the anxiety as well as result in, you know, a more sustainable healthcare system. Um, my thoughts went to, oh, my, my thoughts are going all over the place. <laughs> there, there's so much, there's so much that can be done, um, but let's not get overwhelmed by it. Do what you can, where you are, who you're with, and, uh, let that start with your own life and how you would love to, to, to see it unfold for the years to come, or if it's months to come, hopefully longer, but imagine how you want to leave this world, right? And know that with good planning, it can be gentle, it can be noble, it can be, it can give time to celebrate your life with those you love. You know, don't you want them to raise a glass in your honor and for you to smile and soak up the love? Right? Mm -hmm. Plan it out. Yeah, just take that take that time and, and start the conversation. And I mean, and it's mm -hmm. and it's off, it's something that has to be revisited as well. Once you do engage in, in advanced care planning, is is revisited often. You know, every birthday or tax time or you know when there's a milestone is revisited and reflect on if your wishes and your values and beliefs are still the same because sometimes they change throughout the course of life yeah. but i think as we come to a close oh, sorry I, I sounded like you were going to jump in there with a, a point i, I was ahead. actually i was actually going to ask I, i'm trying i can't remember the name of the website is it speakup.com or is it advanced care planning for now but um what we're finding is we're, we're moving towards our advancedcareplanning.ca. So it's www.advancedcareplanning.ca. And we have a lot of, we're in the midst of, of kind of changing over and making our, our website easier to navigate because there's a lot of information that's available. Um, but interestingly, we've, we've had some new approaches that we've taken this year. Um, we, we developed, or I didn't develop it, um, um, Tara Shannon and Haley McLean um, co-wrote a song called Say, and it speaks to, um, you know, I know you like uh, milk over cream and it's the stones over the beetles, but tell me everything, don't leave anything out. And I don't know if you've had an opportunity to hear it, um, but it's quite a profound way to just, you know, somebody to say, hey, I'm not sure how to start that conversation, but come listen to this song, it's really neat. And, and, and it's about advanced care planning and speaking up and, and not leaving anything out because we think we often know so much about an individual, but then there may be things that we were completely off the mark. And, that, and that's why it's important to have these conversations because then you're not left at the end during that bereavement phase one day, if you're ever in that situation, doubting yourself, did I make the right decision? Is that what they would have wanted? Did she like them? What, what are her, their favorite flowers, for instance? Um, you know, it, it's, it's just a win, win, win. And, and something that um, I hope that more Canadians will invest the time and the courage, because you have to be brave to strike these conversations with your loved ones. Um, Makes me want to put together an advanced care planning playlist. I can think of a bunch of songs that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Well, this song is this song is um, it's quite poignant, and we have a, a public service announcement that we just um, was just put out on our YouTube channel, which is Speak Up and Advanced Care Planning. And we had um, behind the scenes from the United States. Uh, it's hosted by Lawrence Fishburn. Fishburn. Um, to do a documentary on advanced care planning in Canada. And oh, yeah. There are several other countries that look to us to see um, 
what, uh, what we're doing in Canada because of our diversity, our vast land, our challenges with the geography of delivering quality health care. And for the most part, we do a really good job, but there's much work to be done when it comes to hospice palliative care and advanced care planning in Canada. Uh, just very briefly, going back to compassionate communities and the strife in, those, in this world now. Um, I can't remember the website, but Karen Armstrong, fantastic writer, theologian, researcher, social scientist, uh, has um, started something, I think it's called Compassionate Communities, where cities can declare themselves as, as centers of compassion and groups can work towards being a compassionate society. So I'm sure if you put in Karen Armstrong and compassionate communities, you'll, you'll get their website and it's full of resources too. Thank you for sharing that, David. And there's quite a movement within Canada that, that there are cities that are adopting those policies of, of creating healthy communities and, and compassionate communities. So the movement is, is on the uprising in, within Canada and, and people are becoming more engaged in that. So that's encouraging. Let's um, from, not waste the crisis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots of lessons to be learned out of this and, and lots of yeah. takeaways to quality of life for Canadians and healthcare needs um, in the future. Yeah. But I'd, I'd like to take the time to, to thank you for generously giving your time um, to the advanced care planning movement and Speak Up campaign. Um, and lending your thoughts. They've been very valuable in, in hearing from me personally, but I hope that um, by sharing this with others that they too um, will benefit greatly from it. I'm sure they will. Um, and I often, if based on feedback that we would receive from people, I'd welcome you to uh, join us to have another chat. And, and maybe if we hear back from enough people, they can speak to some of the things that they'd like more information on. And that would be nice too, because it's all about you know, working collaboratively and working together and, and helping one another and establishing and, and shaping those those compassionate communities, whether Thank they're you. virtual or yeah. or or in our where we where we call home. Yeah. So I'd be honored to, I'd be honored to have another conversation. Thank you for having me uh, on and uh, to the viewers. Thanks for hanging in through a, a long chat and uh, a lot of deep stuff and you know, God bless yeah. you. Just wish you deep peace and connection all yeah. for this world. Yeah. And again, you know, our, our thoughts and, and our wishes go to those who are suffering um, and enduring hardships across the world um, yeah. beyond our own borders. And um, yeah, be safe and be well. And to everyone who's joined us for this discussion, we hope that you found some great value in it and that perhaps you join us again in the future, but let us know. Um, we do have an info line that is at info at uh, advancedcareplanning.net, I believe, if I'm mistaken. <laughs> I've got so many things floating around in my head today, um, but we'll make sure that we put uh, the web links uh, up to these resources and uh, our, our, our online profile at the end of the presentation. So good night and um, be well, be safe and be grateful, everyone. Good night. Thank you.